So the um, subcommittee on immigration citizenship uh, will come to order, and without objection, the chair is authorized to declare recesses of the subcommittee at any time. We welcome everyone to this morning's hearing, Courts in Crisis, the State of Judicial Independence and Due Process in U.S. Immigration Courts. I'll now, now recognize myself for an opening statement. With today's hearing, we shine a spotlight on an issue that requires urgent congressional attention, the crisis that is unfolding in our nation's immigration courts. In order to be truly effective, the immigration court system should function just like any other judicial institution, where due process and fair procedure are held in the highest regard, and where parties on both sides are treated equally and without bias. Just like other judges, immigration judges should have the time and resources to conduct full and fair hearings, and they should have the independence to issue thoughtful discretionary decisions that are consistent with immigration law. But for too long, our immigration courts, which are housed under the Department of Justice, have not functioned as they should. A historically high backlog, now topping one million, has pushed the system to the brink. And although the administration claims that many of the policies it has implemented are intended to reduce the backlog, it appears that things are only getting worse. In the name of backlog reduction, all immigration judges are now subject to case completion quotas and other performance benchmarks, forcing judges to choose between job security and fair process. In addition, judges' ability to manage their dockets has been severely curtailed. No longer do they have the discretion to administratively close cases, and their ability to continue cases is a fraction of what it once was. As a result, immigrants and their families can be forced through chaotic hearings, often with ha without having the chance to consult with their own counsel. Some will never see an immigration judge in person due to the ever-increasing use of video teleconferencing technology, and sadly, many will be separated from their families and removed from the United States without a fair trial. Despite their best efforts, immigration judges struggle to deliver just and timely decisions. Many judges lack the necessary resources and staff to maximize their productivity, as reports indicate that clerical and support staff haven't been hired at the same pace as new judges. The Attorney General has also empowered his subordinate, the Director of the Executive Office for Immigration Review, to overrule immigration judges in the cases that have been assigned to them. The National Association of Immigration Judges has spoken out against these and other changes, and now the Department of Justice has threatened to decertify their union status. That said, these problems didn't start with this administration. Nonpartisan organizations like the American Bar Association have long decried the problems in our immigration courts. In 2010, the ABA released a comprehensive report documenting these problems including under-resourcing, ambiguous hiring standards, and perceived political influence. In that same report, the ABA called on Congress to establish an independent immigration court. Ten years later, groups like the Federal Bar Association, the American Immigration Lawyers Association, and the National Association of Immigration Judges joined with the ABA to reiterate that suggestion. The current state of the immigration court system is really untenable. Judicial efficiency and respect for due process are basic principles of our democratic society, revered by members on both sides of, this, of the aisle. In other areas of the law, such as bankruptcy and tax, Congress established independent Article I courts where political influence over adjudicators is limited. Creating an independent immigration court seems to me like a no-brainer, but I look forward to hearing from our witnesses as to how they think the system should be reformed. And I should note uh, that after my opening statement, I will be handing the gavel over to the vice chair, Ms. Jayapal, but I will carefully study your written statements as well as your answers to the questions. I actually think the time that to act is, is really now. It's my hope that this hearing will be a first step towards negotiating a bipartisan, workable solution 
to what is really a crisis in our immigration courts. I'm committed to working with my friends and colleagues across the aisle to make this a new reality. And now I will recognize the ranking member of the subcommittee, the gentleman from, Mr. Col uh, from Colorado, Mr. Buck, for his opening statement, and hand the gavel to Ms. Jayapal. Thank you very much. I thank the chair and, and the new chair for recognizing me. I am confident in the due process of our immigration judges that our immigration judges provide to the parties appearing before them and am equally confident in their ability to faithfully apply the law to the facts of the case. U.S. immigration judges consistently rise to the challenge in a difficult environment, adjudicating cases impartially and professionally, and most do their jobs without complaint. Even with a 35-day government shutdown, the Immigration Judge Corps completed 275 cases in fiscal year 2019 and that is a historically high number of completions and nearly double the number from just three years ago. In any court system, issues arise, I'm sorry, in any court systems, issues will arise that affect the caseload, backlog, and morale of those who work there. The Trump administration has recognized many of these issues and taken action. For instance, the lack of electronic filing has been a concern for many years. This administration began implementing the ECAS system nationwide and will continue to do so over the next year and a half until it is available at all immigration courts. The administration has prioritized case completion where the immigrant is being held in detention, in credible fear reviews, and in cases with a regulatory or statutory deadline. While reasonable minds may, can disagree on whether a given step is the right remedy, the fact that this administration is trying to fix problems cannot be disputed. I understand that the size of the case backlog is a concern. For the first time ever, it stands at over one million cases. But we should be clear that this backlog is not a new phenomenon. It has been growing for years, and it's important to understand the factors that have, been, that have driven the backlog. Even during the 2019, when immigration judges completed a record high of 275,000 cases, the backlog increased substantially, given that nearly half a million new cases were added to the docket. Of course, no one should be surprised at that given the astronomical number of immigrants presenting at the southern border seeking asylum or other immigration benefits. It's not hard to understand that the backlog grows when individuals fail to appear for their court hearings, since the time allotted for those proceedings could have gone toward the completion of a case where an appearance is made. Unfortunately, the failure to appear rate is as high as ever. 45% of all case completions in fiscal year 2019, 89,919 cases, involved in in absentia removal orders. Frivolous and fraudulent claims are also a problem that add to the backlog. The system rewards fraudulent claims by allowing the claimant to remain in the United States for years. These cases also utilize precious court time that should go towards legitimate cases. The current administration has made changes to reduce the number of continuances and to increase judicial efficiency. One such change followed GAO and DOJ Inspector General recommendations to implement performance metrics and case completion goals. I understand that this has led to questions by the Immigration Judge Union as to whether judges would be disciplined or fired if they did not meet the goal of 700 case completions in a year. The Executive Office for Immigration Review has been clear, however, that the completion goal was just one part of a multi-dimensional performance review and that factors specific to each judge's docket would be taken into account. And according to EOIR for 2019, no judge was penalized in their performance evaluation that they failed to meet the 700 case completion goal. In fact, immigration judges should be commended. On average, they completed a record high 708 cases. In their written testimony, some of today's witnesses lament the perceived lack of judicial independence of the IJ Corps. But the immigration courts were created by Congress as a component of the Department of Justice, and they are bound by the law as interpreted by the Attorney General. Some of the witnesses here today support the idea of making the immigration courts an Article I court. While, the, while that claim is, is such a move will make the problems, while the claim is that such a move will fix the problems, I am unconvinced of that position. I look forward to hearing from all the witnesses today, given their unique expertise in the field. I thank the Chair and yield back. Thank you, Mr. Buck. It is now my pleasure to introduce today's witnesses. 
Judge Ashley Tabador. The Honorable Ashley Tabador is president of the National Association of Immigration Judges, an immigration judge based in Los Angeles, California, and an adjunct professor with the UCLA School of Law. She was appointed to the immigration bench in November of 2005. Prior to her appointment, Judge Tabador served as assistant U.S. attorney for the Central District of California and as a trial attorney with the Department of Justice Civil Division in Washington, D.C. Judge Tabador has been honored for judicial excellence by numerous organizations, including the Mexican American Bar Association and the Arab American Lawyers Association. She received her BA from UCLA and JD from the University of California, Hastings College of the Law. Jeremy McKinney is an immigration attorney based in Greensboro, North Carolina, and is second vice president of the American Immigration Lawyers Association, or AILA. Mr. McKinney has more than 20 years of experience practicing immigration law, and its founder is founder of McKinney Immigration Law with offices in Greensboro and Wilmington, North Carolina. He has been active in AILA leadership since 1997 and has spoken extensively on national platforms regarding the immigration court system. Mr. McKinney received his BA from Virginia Commonwealth University and his JD from Campbell University School of Law. Judy Perry Martinez is president of the American Bar Association, or the ABA, and counsel at Simon Perry, Jean, Smith, and Redfern in New Orleans. Prior to assuming her current position, Ms. Martinez served in various positions, including assistant general counsel for litigation and chief compliance officer at Northrop Grumman. Ms. Martinez has been active with the ABA for 35 years, holding various leadership positions, including chair of the Standing Committee on the Federal Judiciary and member of the ABA Board of Governors. She received her bachelor's degree from the University of New Orleans and her JD from Tulane Law School. Andrew R. Arthur, the Honorable Andrew Art Arthur, is a resident fellow in law and policy for the Center of Immigration for Immigration Studies. Uh, and former immigration judge serving at York Immigration Court in York, Pennsylvania from 2006 to 2015. Mr. Arthur also served as an associate general counsel for the former Immigration and Naturalization Service, as well as counsel to the House Judiciary Committee and staff director to the House Oversight Committee. He received his bachelor's degree from the University of Virginia and his JD from the George Washington University School of Law. We welcome all of our distinguished witnesses and thank them for participating in today's hearing. Now, if you would please rise, I will begin by swearing you in. Do you swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you are about to give is true and correct to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? So help you God. Let the record show the witnesses answered in the affirmative. Thank you, and please be seated. Please note that each of your written statements will be entered into the record in its entirety. Accordingly, I ask that you summarize your testimony in five minutes, and to help you stay within that time, there is a timing light on your table. When the light switches from green to yellow, you have one minute to conclude your testimony. When the light turns red, it signals your five minutes have expired. Judge Tabador, you may begin. I'm a novice at this, so bear with me. Well, my name is Ashley Tabador. I'm, I'm the president of the National Association of Immigration Judges and a sitting judge for the past 15 years. I appear today on behalf of NAIJ, as was mentioned, and we are the official union for the 440 immigration judges across the United States. I have served in the Department of Justice for well over 20 years, spanning four administrations, at least a half a dozen attorney generals. And I've observed with each administration and each attorney general, he or she has brought with them a set of law enforcement priorities for the department to pursue. And each of them has had to grapple with this conflicting mission to the law enforcement priorities of the department and the role of the Department of Justice as overseeing the immigration court. And I can assure you that each of, you, each of them has failed in one way or another. So in 2003, Congress took a major step forward 
by separating out the functions of the Immigration and Naturalization Service from the Department of Justice and moving it into the newly created Department of Homeland Security. This step forward demonstrated Congress's commitment to properly separating the law enforcement priorities of the executive branch from the adjudicatory role that the executive branch plays. However, this conflict and this tension has continued to persist within the Department of Justice because of its close working relationship with Department of Homeland Security. Regardless of the administration, law enforcement focus of the Department of Justice has consistently interfered with and compromised the immigration court system. Yet, in the 23 years that I have served at the Justice Department, I have never seen the level of hostility toward immigration judges who preside over immigration proceedings, the individuals who appear before them, or the due process rights that the Constitution and this body, Congress, has provided in our laws. Using the pretext of the backlog through one policy announcement after another, the Department of Justice has transformed the court into a law enforcement assembly line. We've talked about the quotas and deadlines. In fiscal year 2019 was the first time that the department subjected judges to this unprecedented act of 700 case completion quotas a year and a series of metrics as a condition of our continued employment. This policy pits the judges' personal financial interests, their job security, against the oath of office to be an independent, impartial decision maker. Fiscal year 2019 is over. Did the policy reduce the backlog? Of course not. To the contrary, as we've heard, it has actually doubled in the last three years, from 600,000 to well over one million cases. And this is in spite of the hiring spree of over 200 judges in the same period of time. Now, we're the judges who spend every workday hearing cases back to back, morning and afternoon. Some of my colleagues have upwards of six to 7,000 cases pending on their docket. Did they meet these quotas and deadlines? Again, of course not. Over 60% of the nation's immigration judges did not reach the 700 case completion quotas. And a stunning 99% of the judges fell short of satisfying the requirements of the full metrics. The data is not surprising. The metrics are, are, are unrealistic. Yes, we've heard that no one has been penalized this year. So why do it? The purpose of the metrics is to goad judges to put speed over substance and automate their decisions to the will of the administration. And making matters worse, EOR, the agency within the department overseeing the court, recently issued a new regulation that fundamentally changed the nature of the agency. Overturning decades of rules and practice, the new rule vested the EOR director, who is not even required to be an attorney, with the authority to review immigration judge decisions on appeal and to issue precedential decisions rewriting the law. So now judges not only have to worry about the speed with which they process cases, but they have to consider whether the head of the agency is going to agree with their decisions granting or denying asylum in a life and death matters that are before them, or otherwise fear penalizing, suffering personally for it. Not to be outdone, the Department of Justice has also filed a petition to decertify us and silence the public voice of transparency and accountability that we have brought to this immigration court system discourse. If they should prevail, it will be the proverbial final nail in the coffin of decisional independence for immigration judges. Imagine stepping into a courtroom where your life depended on the outcome of the case, only to find out that the judge was hired by the prosecutor, that she can be fired by the prosecutor, that the prosecutor too could step in any time to overrule the judge, and by the way, the prosecutor would really like for the judge to finish the case today. This is not what America stands for. These are not the principles upon which our constitution and country were founded. We as a nation can no longer afford the continuation of the status quo. Please create an Article I court. Give us the independence we need for the American people. Thank you. Thank you, Judge Tab uh, Tabador. Mr. McKinney, you are recognized. Thank you so much. Chairwoman Jayapal, Ranking Member Buck, and members of the subcommittee, 
Thank you for inviting me to speak with you today about the urgent need to protect and reform our immigration courts. My name is Jeremy McKinney. Uh, I am the American Immigration Lawyers Association second vice president and an attorney with more than two decades of experience representing people facing deportation, primarily in Charlotte, Atlanta, and Lumpkin, Georgia. As an initial observation, two of the terms you will hear repeatedly today are misnomers, courts and judges. We call it immigration court, but in actuality, the parties appear before Department of Justice entities known collectively as the Executive Office for Immigration Review, or EOR. EOR reports to the Attorney General. At the same time, as in the words of former Attorney General Jeff Sessions, the Attorney General, quote, effectuates the President's agenda, unquote. That includes supervision of the Department of Justice attorneys who prosecute immigration cases in Article III federal courts. The Department of Justice is not a court. It is a law enforcement agency, and yet the immigration court system is housed within it. We call the adjudicators in these Department of Justice entities judges, but the immigration judges are not considered judges by DOJ itself. They are simply employees of the law enforcement agency. Our immigration court system has a conflict of interest built into it. To ensure fundamental fairness and an efficient functioning court system, judges must be allowed to act as neutral arbiters of fact and law, regardless of who is in power. Instead, this administration, and importantly, other administrations before it, exploit the structural infirmity to further political agendas. President Obama's administration prioritized the adjudication of family unit cases. Eeyore later reported the Obama administration's docket reshuffling, quote, coincided with some of the lowest levels of case completion productivity in Eeyore's history, unquote. The current administration also routinely places its finger on the scales of justice. Using his power to certify removal cases to himself, the Attorney General has ended administrative closure, ended the ability of judges to terminate cases, attacked the ability of judges to continue cases. These policies have directly impacted my clients. For example, a Charlotte immigration judge who handles the juvenile docket recently chided our, our bar to stop filing motions to terminate in cases where a child is eligible for relief before another agency, in this case, USCIS. Instead, this judge is forced to clog her docket with contested hearings about children. Many cases, many cases can be resolved by other agencies, including cases where a person can depart the United States and pursue an immigrant visa abroad. But this series of decisions removes the power of immigration judges to control their own dockets and keeps the parties stuck in litigation. EOR itself has made it worse, following suit with actual quotas on immigration judges and attempts to terminate the judges' union. As a result, courts are in crisis and not resolving cases in a consistent manner. For example, if I appear in Arlington, Virginia, I know the chance my client will be denied asylum is a little over 50%, which is in line with the national average, about a 50-50 shot. If I appear closer to home in Charlotte, North Carolina, a jurisdiction under the Fourth Circuit with identical case law, that number jumps to 90%. Head down I-85 to Atlanta, or Lumpkin, Georgia, and that number jumps to a staggering 97% denial rate. That is not the kind of justice that Americans want. Regardless of one's substantive views on the law or one's preferred outcomes, we should all agree that an independent Article I immigration court removed from political pressure as much as possible is critically needed to secure due process. But even beyond the constitutional guarantee of due process, the attempts at assembly line justice are simply not working. Under the current administration, the backlog is more than doubled, 
and now exceeds one million. Doing the right thing here is not only constitutionally required, it is also just sound public policy. When we curtail a person's right to a full and fair hearing, like plowing ahead with a contested hearing instead of allowing the parties to send it to another agency to resolve, we increase, not decrease litigation, we increase appeals, not decrease. Mr. This McKinney, if you, your time has expired. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Ms. Martinez, you are recognized. Good morning, Chair Jayapal, Ranking Member Buck, and members of the subcommittee. My name is Judy Perry Martinez, and I'm President of the American Bar Association. And the ABA appreciates the opportunity to share our views on the state of judicial independence and due process in the U.S. immigration courts. I am not an immigration lawyer, but I have litigated for more than 35 years, both in private practice as in, an in-house counsel, and also served as chief compliance officer in the aerospace and defense industry. I've traveled to Texas, to the border of South Texas several times, volunteering for a work week. And when I did so, I traveled to help at our pro bar work. And I traveled to help those seeking asylum. I interviewed individuals in detention, spent time observing proceedings in immigration court. I toured the Brownville Port Court before it opened and crossed into Mexico to see how the asylum seekers are faring in, in Matamoros as they waited for their day in court. What I have seen personally and what the ABA has determined through its various projects and studies is that there are serious challenges to due process in our current immigration court system. Judicial independence is at significant risk and that fundamental change is necessary. One of the distinctive hallmarks of our democracy is an independent judiciary, the principle that all those present in our country are entitled to a fair and impartial consideration in legal proceedings where important rights and privileges are at stake. The immigration courts issue life-altering decisions each day that may deprive individuals of their freedom, separate families, and in the case of those seeking asylum, may be a matter of life and death. Yet the immigration court system lacks the basic structural and procedural safeguards that we take for granted in other areas of our American justice system. This issue is not new to the American Bar Association. The ABA Commission on Immigration in 2010 issued a comprehensive report on the immigration removal adjudication system in an update in 2019. Both reports found serious flaws in the system and ultimately determined that the immigration courts must be moved out of the Department of Justice to ensure judges have full decision-making authority and independence without fear of reprisal or improper political influence. After evaluating several models, we concluded that an independent Article I court should be established. Judicial independence is a key component of due process, and over the course of many administrations, we have seen the adoption of policies that undermine independence of, judicial, of immigration judges' ability to perform their role as neutral arbitrators of fact and law and the prioritization of cases accelerates over due process. Recent examples include the increased use of attorney general certifications authorities, implementation of and greater reliance on problematic performance metrics, reshuffling of dockets to match enforcement priorities over efficient management, and the elimination of previously available docket management tools. Other serious considerations that impact due process include the continuing challenge to ensure access to counsel in immigration proceedings. We hope that one day a system of appointed counsel will be available. But until that day, until that happens, it is vital to maintain and enhance programs such as the Legal Orientation Program that seeks to increase access to legal information and representation for non-citizens in immigration proceedings. We appreciate Congress's past support of LOP and urge that it continue. Another serious issue of concern is EOIR's recent uh, initiative to replace in-court interpreters with informational videos at initial immigration court proceedings. 
Without reliable and accurate interpretation services, unrepresented non-citizens have little or no ability to meaningful participate in court proceedings. This is why the ABA has long supported the use of in-person language interpreters in all courts, including immigration. Finally, many of our concerns regarding the lack of due process in immigration court systems are exemplified and exacerbated by the Remain in Mexico program. There are serious issues with access to counsel, with only about 4% of persons in MPP having the ability to have representation. For those who do find a lawyer, their ability to consult is severely limited in the 10 courts, forcing counsel to potentially travel to dangerous locations in Mexico. The procedures also inhibit due process. Notices to appear issued with insufficient addresses, respondents having, travel, having to travel through dangerous areas, and proceedings conducted, conducted through video teleconferencing, mostly out of sight of the public and only limited access on the day of the hearing to meet with counsel, and no right to meet with counsel following a hearing. This does not look like justice. These are fundamental violations of due process Ms. and the Perry right Martinez. to meaningful access, and we urge you to take action now. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Arthur, you're recognized. Vice Chairman Jaya, Paul Ranking, Member Buck, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for inviting me as a guest today. The 465 immigration judges in our nation's 63 immigration courts and the agency for which they work, EOR, play a crucial role in our system of justice and national security but face many challenges. EOR had been an afterthought for decades. It was inadequately funded and did not receive appropriate guidance or oversight from the executive branch. It has also borne the consequences of various executive branch immigration policies and priorities, as well as statutory flaws and poorly reasoned judicial opinions that have encouraged migrants to enter and remain in the United States illegally. In FY 2019, 851,508 migrants were apprehended entering illegally along the southern border, a 13-year high. And in a change from the not-so-distant past, the majority, 473,682, were adults with children, known as FMUs. The overwhelmed limited DHS resources resulting in many being released with nothing more than an NTA and a court date. A federal bipartisan panel determined that such releases were the major, quote, pull factor, close quote, drawing those migrants to enter illegally at great danger to all and trauma to their children, which was exacerbated by a 2015 ruling that accompanied minors be released within 20 days by DHS. Largely as a result of the border crisis, IJs now face a crushing caseload of almost 1.1 million, not counting hundreds of thousands that are administratively closed. The backlog is bad for the parties, bad for the court, and bad for our system of justice. The administration, and in particular DOJ, have responded to the crisis where uh, Congress has not. Using their certification authority, the last three attorneys general have created bright line rules for IJs and the BIA to follow. The administration has fought for funding and worked with our regional partners to craft policies to turn off magnets that draw migrants to enter illegally. These policies, though controversial, have worked and done so consistent with due process. December 2019 saw the lowest number of migrants apprehended at the border in 15 months. One such policy, the Migrant Protection Protocols, which is authorized by Section 235B of the INA, requires inadmissible migrants at the southern border to wait for their hearings in Mexico. Last week, I observed MPP hearings in Texas and found that the IJs went above and beyond providing due process to those respondents. Performance metrics for IJs instituted in October 2018 have also been controversial, but I note that last year, IJs completed more than 275,000 cases, 92% more than in FY 2016, with just 97 IJ complaints, 42% fewer than four years before. The number of circuit court remands to EOR, 602, is the lowest in 12 years, and just over one-third of the number of remands in FY 2008. I would also notice, note that Congress itself has mandated completion goals for asylum cases in Section 208D of the INA, requiring those cases be adjudicated within 180 days, absent exceptional circumstances. Some who oppose these initiatives have called for abandoning the EOR system and creating an independent Article I court outside the executive branch. This will not resolve the issues IJs face, which are largely driven by a lingering lack of resources in the backlog, which in turn is driven by the crisis at the border exacerbated by the aforementioned legal flaws. Moreover, any restructuring would be complicated and expensive, absorbing resources that would be better directed toward improving EOR and providing it with more funding. The arguments in favor of restructuring are less compelling than they would appear. 
I served attorneys general from both parties, and my independent judgment was never impinged in any way. Nor was there any perception that my decisions were influenced by the fact that I had been a former INS attorney. Ella gave me a plaque thanking me for my service. I had a relatively high level of autonomy over my docket and could rearrange cases in appropriate situations. Most importantly, I ran my court in a professional manner and expected the same of the parties who appeared before me. The arguments against restructuring, on the other hand, are compelling. Removing the functions of EUR from DOJ would have serious constitutional implications. Immigration determinations are closely tied to the foreign policy of the United States, an issue traditionally recognized as solely within the purview of the executive branch. In fact, the Judicial Conference of the United States, the policy-making body for the federal court, generally opposes specialized courts in the judiciary and advises that any Article I immigration court remain in the executive branch. It would also largely remove congressional oversight of the courts, an issue that matters to me as a former staffer. Finally, an Article I court would struggle for resources. Immigration is a contentious issue. In a future Congress with the power of the purse could easily starve an immigration court it did not agree with of funding. Our IGs need more resources and bright line rules to guide their determinations. Both resources and guidance have been lacking for years. Fortunately, the administration has made both a priority. Thank you for the opportunity to appear today, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Arthur. We will now proceed under the five-minute rule with questions, and I will begin by recognizing myself for five minutes. Judge Tabador, in your testimony, you described the recent implementation of several new policies and attorney general decisions that have significantly limited judicial discretion, both procedurally and substantively. Based on your own personal experience, as well as feedback from other immigration judges, how have these new policies, including the case completion quotas, uh, change the way that you conduct immigration hearings? Thank you. We've talked about the, um, the certification process. That's been one that has been used. It's a highly politicized um, uh, process. It removed the ability of the judges that had been recognized for 40 years to administratively close cases that are not ready for review. So I have been handling the juvenile docket now for past 10 years. I used to be able to put those cases that need outside state court action first aside on admin closure. Now I have to carry hundreds of cases on my docket that I would like to use for live cases just because I'm no longer allowed to um, administratively close them. We are then pushed to not continue cases. And while due process, of course, includes a recognition that justice delayed is justice denied. But by the same token, when a continuance is warranted, it should be granted. And judges are feeling the pressure. There's the constant pressure and fear of being penalized. And finally, as I mentioned, the director is now being given, has been given the authority to overturn our decisions. And part of the metrics is if we get more than a 15% remand, we may lose our job. So now the judges are very worried about the decisions they're making on asylum, on cancellation, on life and death decisions. So these are very real, concrete intrusion into our decisional independence. And what has that done to the morale of the immigration judge corps? I've been on the bench for about 15 years, and I've never seen it this bad. As I've said, the level of hostility towards us, the, the insulting and offensive way in which we are being treated by the imposition of these quotas, by the imposition of these rules, at the micromanagement of our daily dockets, it's frankly unprecedented. Thank you. Mr. McKinney, from your perspective, how have the case completion quotas, performance benchmarks, and other changes impacted your ability to ensure that your clients actually receive a fair day in court? Thank you for the question. I, I first want to point out that I practice in the interior, in North Carolina and uh, Georgia, primarily. Uh, and so while some may have you believe that this backlog is caused by uh, the numbers of people applying for asylum at the border, uh, it's really a combination of a lot of factors uh, that have played into it, including and especially these uh, AG certifications uh, that have really uh, taken away, stripped the judges of their ability to control their own docket. So just as a, as a quick example, uh, docket reshuffling. That's, that is something that was engaged in uh, by the Obama administration and the Trump administration. And what happens in both instances is that it, re it results in a significant reduction in productivity from the judges. A member in Colorado, uh, Vela, reported yesterday she has about 30 days to submit asylum uh, evidence for four people instead of three months. 
uh, and why? Because of docket reshuffling, uh, this administration decided to start a pilot program this week to expedite family asylum cases, and the notices are coming like that. So suddenly you have 30 days to find corroborating evidence uh, for four people. This results in lower productivity. Uh, I have a complex case where an immigration judge requested written closing arguments. When the parties pulled the audio, we discovered the microphones were not functioning properly. We brought this to the judge's attention, and the judge has decided to plow ahead anyway. Now, I don't know the impulse. I, of course, don't, I'm, I can't reach inside that judge's mind to know why, but I can't help but think it is because of the pressure he's receiving. Thank you, Mr. McKinney. And Ms. Martinez, the ABA has published two reports detailing the problems in our court system uh, and have concluded that transitioning to an Article I court, as you mentioned, is the best approach. How would that solve many of the problems? And I'm sorry, you just have about, you know, 38 or 37 seconds to answer that question. Thank you. What one court would do is to assure greater independence of the courts. And that is critical, not only for the court itself, but for the perception of the independence of that court to the people who it serves, and for the lawyers who come before it, and for those who look to our courts as a whole. And we want them to have trust and confidence in our entire judicial system. And having an Article I court in the immigration courts would be one way to do that. Thank you so much. Uh, I now recognize the uh, uh, gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Biggs, for his five minutes. I, th I thank the gentlelady, and I appreciate all of you being here today. And this is a this is a vexing and a, a truly a problem problem that we need to we need to get a handle on. Um, Judge Arthur, you said in your oral testimony today, uh, and also in your written testimony, that uh, more resources and bright line rules are necessary to uh, effectuate a reduction in the backlog. Tell me what you meant by resources, and tell me what you mean by bright line rules. With respect to resources, Mr. Biggs, I'm talking about more immigration judges, but not just that, more staff, more judicial law clerks, uh, all around. Uh, because my staff, when I was a judge, was absolutely crucial to me getting my cases done on time. I read Judge Tabador's testimony. Uh, she makes some points about the uh, the inability to fi or the uh, failure to hire staff that needs to be done. Um, with respect to bright line rules, when I was a judge, we had vague concepts like you can grant a continuance for good cause shown. Good cause isn't actually defined anywhere, and the case law that existed really wasn't very helpful. Immigration judges run a risk if they deny a continuance and it goes up on appeal to the uh, circuit court and they find that they violated due process. That's a serious blemish on a judge's record and one that could potentially result in punishment by the Department of Justice, punishment by the courts. So bright line rules like that are important. Bright line rules for asylum cases where uh, it's more clear to the uh, judge in some, Mr. Know, Arthur, before you continue, I have to yield to uh, Congressman Buck. Thank you. Finish your answer. Oh, uh, in order to guide the uh, decision and in order to uh, make it easier for the tribunal to do it in a timely fashion, I note, Mr. Buck, as I stated in my opening statement, Congress has said judges have 180 days to adjudicate immigration uh, asylum cases absent due process. That truly does put the hammer on the judges. And that's not uh, Eeyore doing that. That's this body. I, I thank the gentleman for his answer, and I, I will yield back. Thank you. Um, I now recognize the gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Nagoose, for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, for holding this important hearing. Thank you to each of the witnesses for uh, your testimony today. Shrouded in secrecy, the immigration court system run by the DOJ has been dysfunctional for years, as, as many of you have attested to during your testimony. And certainly, in my view, under this administration, it's only gotten worse. Uh, as we know from much of the testimony we heard this morning, as well as press reports, uh, again, my view, housing our immigration court system within the DOG, DOJ excuse me, has left it vulnerable to political interference. It's a structural flaw that has been exploited time and time again. And despite the life or death stakes of many of these cases, our immigration court system has less to do with the rule of law than with the luck of the draw. And this administration 
has long allowed enforcement priorities to preempt a court process that is meant to be independent and fair. And if that weren't enough, the mechanism to hold immigration judges accountable, the appeals process has been corrupted by the political interference of the Attorney General, uh, both current and past. And this issue, as I suspect, uh, is the case for many of the folks who are gathered here today to participate in this hearing, is personal to me. My parents uh, were refugees who came to this country uh, nearly 40 years ago. Uh, having an immigration system that works and having a judicial system uh, that works uh, with respect to immigration matters a great deal to my constituents and the people that I represent in Colorado. I want to touch on an issue in particular uh, that's occurred in the Denver uh, immigration uh, court system. As I'm sure uh, each of you are aware, in fall of 2018, as part of a pilot program, the Department of Justice instructed 10 immigration courts to accelerate the cases of families seeking asylum. And in Denver, uh, that instruction is being carried out in a series of group hearings uh, designed to decide cases in less than a year, and that compares to the three to four years it typically takes uh, for asylum cases to be assessed. Uh, Mr. McKinney, and, and then I, I'd like to have uh, Judge Tabador answer this question as well, does this accelerated timeline make it easier or harder for families seeking asylum to attain a lawyer? I, it of course makes it uh, more uh, difficult. Uh, Representative, thank you so much for your question. Um, but even once you obtain counsel, if uh, that happens, which of course happens in less than half of immigration cases, uh, then we have the burden of reasonably corroborating everywhere we can possibly do so. So uh, our office, for example, uh, will try to contact neighbors uh, from the person's native country, medical professionals, uh, courts, police, wherever we can to corroborate our client's story. Uh, that takes time. Sometimes it does not. Sometimes we're ready to go. Uh, but it's that freedom within the court to have that conference with the judge and with DHS counsel and talk about the evidentiary needs. It will differ from case to case. So having these bright line rules uh, really impacts due process. Thank you. Judge Tabador, if you care to comment, both res with respect to uh, obtaining an attorney, but also, as Mr. McKinney said, the, the perhaps equally important consideration of having time to acquire evidence. What we have seen is what, what assembly line justice. So we had never seen a situation where the judges are told you have 365 days to complete this case. And because of that, the judges feel the pressure to shorten the amount of time that people need to be able to find counsel. And then once counsel is obtained, the judges feel pressure to want to schedule that case within that 360 days. And then a lot of times what happens is the agency keeps track of every single one of these cases, and for every single one you have to be accountable for. And so what they do is shuffle. So if a judge, they come in and say, oh, okay, you heard the first one, we're gonna put in somebody else now. Now somebody else who hasn't had a history of dealing with this case has to get up to speed. Everything is about this factory model of management and treating people like widgets. So it's become very, very onerous on the judges as well. Thank you, uh, Judge Trevor, for your answer and for your service. We should all take a moment to pause because what you said, I, I thought is worth underscoring. The phrase that you used of assembly line justice, it should offend every person on this dais. It certainly offends me as a lawyer, and it offends me as a son of immigrants uh, that this Department of Justice has decided to institute a pilot program that has resulted in that outcome, and we shouldn't tolerate it. And I appreciate the work that you and your colleagues are doing under such trying circumstances. I yield back. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. I now recognize the ranking member of the subcommittee, Mr. Buck, for his five minutes. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, I have to tell you, this is a very frustrating area. I think everyone up here is frustrated by this situation, and, and for different reasons, frankly. And it's one of the beautiful things about Congress. Uh, I uh, am working with people that are, um, I guess some people consider me uh, to the right of center, and I am working with some people to the left of center, and we agree for different reasons on, on war powers, for example, on uh, the detention of refugees, uh, um, and, and many other things. Um, but not one of you mentioned the cause of why we're here. 
and that is people breaking our law and crossing our border. Not one of you talked about the need for border security. Not one of you has talked about the, the, the process. Um, and and uh, Judge, I have to tell you, I'm frustrated when you say in your opening statement, Mr. McKinney had me halfway there before the hearing, um, but when you say in your opening statement that this uh, quota of, of 700 cases uh, has not reduced the backlog, the truth is the backlog is caused by more illegal immigrants coming into this country and ending up in your court. It's not caused by quotas or lack of quotas. And, and, it's, and when you talk about the difference in um, denial rates between Northern Virginia and Atlanta, there are fundamentally different uh, uh, circumstances at play in Northern Virginia than in Atlanta. And so it's not just, it's not fair to make those kinds of comparisons. And I, th I think if, if we're going to get to a good answer on this, and it may be uh, in, in Article I court, I don't know, but I, I think we've got to, uh, uh, on both sides, stop dealing with the, uh, uh, somebody a lot smarter than me said there are three types of lies. Uh, there are lies, damn lies, and statistics. And I think when you use statistics uh, in, a, in a misleading way, it doesn't help us get to the right answer. Um, and I have been very impressed uh, with the American Immigration Law Association uh, and their willingness uh, to talk my language to me um, and uh, help me grapple with these very difficult issues. But um, Mr. McKinney, let me ask you a question. Uh, what happens if uh, someone applies for a, a visa or asylum at one of our embassies? Uh, and, and I need a quick answer. They, 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 go, they, go, they go to a window, they file their application, a Department of State employee reviews that application and makes a decision. Uh, that's correct, except for uh, asylum, uh, which happens in the interior of the country, yes, sir. Okay, but, but uh, they can make the same claims as to why they should be able to enter the country at a Department of State facility. Uh, very difficult to do so, but yes, one could uh, potentially seek uh, refugee status outside of the United States. They could go from El Salvador, they could go to Mexico, uh, uh, enter the U.S. consulate or a facility that, that's set up for that purpose, and they could apply for that. I, I would, we need to reform the process to make it possible to do things like that. But in reality, and again, this is a reality that I've seen for two plus decades, that is not the case. Okay, uh, uh, then I'll stick with visa, okay? We, we both agree that's the process for a visa. Absolutely. Okay, um, it's not a judge that reviews that application, is it? Uh, it is not, it is a Department of State adjudicator. And it's not, uh, they are not entitled to an attorney, are they? Outside of the United States, uh, one is not afforded constitutional protections. So when somebody uh, uh, breaks our law and comes into this country illegally, we all of a sudden, according to Ms. Martinez, we all of a sudden are supposed to give them enhanced rights for breaking our law. We're supposed to now say, you get a judge. Not only do you get a judge that's a Department of Justice employee, but you get a judge who is uh, independent and, and unaccountable uh, to a, a political system, to elected officials. You now get somebody who is uh, insulated from the reality that the rest of us have to deal with. And you get a lawyer, or at least some people are advocating, you get a lawyer for breaking our law. How is that a disincentive to break American law? I couple of reasons to that. One, one thing is that uh, our framers uh, specifically use the term due process twice, uh, both in the Constitution and the Fifth Amendment, and then later uh, after the Civil War in the 14th Amendment, and it extended due process of law to all persons. Uh, so uh, unless we choose to go down a road where we're debating whether undocumented immigrants or people, they have rights in the country, and one of those rights is to a fundamentally fair hearing. Now, uh, what our argument has been to you, Representative, um, is that both administrations have botched this up, uh, whether it's Democrat or Republican, uh, because at, fundamentally at the core, you have that administration's political proclivities 
directing what is supposed to be a neutral and fundamentally fair process. And that's what we're asking to change. I think there is a lot of middle ground here to be reached and that it's a nonpartisan issue. Gentleman yields back. Um, I did want to clarify that you can't walk into a U.S. Embassy unless you have an actual applica, if you have an actual appointment, an application. Um, and obviously asylum status is different than refugee status as well. So now I'd like to recognize the gentlewoman from Texas for five minutes, Ms. Escobar. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to our witnesses today. I really appreciate the information you provided us. I represent El Paso, Texas, which has been on the front line of many of the Trump administration's policies like MPP, like family separation. And what is troubling when, when we're talking about access to justice or access to um, the asylum process, what's troubling to hear is that, um, well, let's just speed it up, because we have so many um, Central American families or Cuban families or Cuban individuals or wherever they're coming from arriving at our door. Let's just speed it up. And so it's this idea that, um, that certain people don't deserve justice. We just want to kind of get rid of the cases and, and move along and, and um, avoid dealing with the fact that we have laws and that we should uphold justice for everyone. So your voices have been very important in this process. I want to thank you. A recent report from the Transactional Records Access Clearinghouse, or TRAC, discovered gross irregularities in recent data releases from the EOIR. From garbled data to millions of records disappearing from one data release to the next, Several of my colleagues and I wrote a letter to GAO requesting that they investigate data management practices at EOIR. Fortunately, GAO agreed to review these practices, and Madam Chair, I'd like unanimous consent to enter the letter into the record. Accepted. For Judge Tabador, shortly after TRAC made these data mismanagement practices public, you as president of the NIJ released a statement condemning these systemic inaccuracies and calling upon the DOJ to fix them. Can you tell us why these inaccuracies are harmful? Like for the American public, why is this a bad thing? And has DOJ fixed these reports or these records? Thank you for the opportunity to um respond to this question. And as uh, Representative Buck said, you know, statistics obviously um, have their controversial role. We rely heavily on the agency uh, data. I mean, that's who we turn to. So when I'm citing to statistic, I'm not making it up because I'm looking at what the agency has produced. And so it is really important for those numbers to be accurate. And what we have seen, unfortunately, is that key portions of data are being manipulated. The, the, a lot of times the statistics matter what you put in the denominator, what you put in the numerator. So if you don't have information to be able to verify, it can really impact the accuracy of it. Personally, I remember getting calls from press and asking me, saying, look, we've received this FOIA request, which is this response to a request for information on data. It's telling us that unaccompanied juveniles are failing to appear at rates of 40 percent. And, and I was shocked, frankly, to hear that because I've been sitting on the juvenile docket in one of the largest courts in the nation for 10 years, and we have a working relationship with other immigration judges across the country with this particular issue. We, we don't see anywhere near those numbers. And then when the myths versus facts sheet came out, we saw a lot of numbers that they were putting forth that there was no way to even verify whether it's accurate. So. This type of information, this type of activity on a part of a court system that's supposed to be neutral is quite harmful because it frankly compromises the integrity and the respect that the court deserves. And it's used sometimes by the administration or supporters of these policies to basically defend why, or to, to claim that, that asylum seekers aren't uh, adequately winning cases or showing up, or so the data is important. It's been very difficult because it's been they, they produce it in ways to support a specific, specific narrative. Right. And that becomes difficult when we don't have all of the information. And has DOJ fixed the problem? As far as I know, no. Okay. I didn't think so. Thank you. Today marks the one-year anniversary of this administration's horrific, abhorrent migrant protection protocol policy, the return to Mexico policy, a policy that essentially um, puts 
asylum seekers who are in the American court system in another country, a country that is not their own, where they don't know anyone, where they have no way of being safe or staying safe. We've had accounts of uh, people in MPP who have been kidnapped, women who have been sexually assaulted, people who have disappeared altogether. The, the American government has essentially created a new criminal enterprise on the other side of border communities like mine, a, a criminal enterprise that preys on vulnerable migrants. For uh, Judy Perry Martinez, oh, I'm out of time. Thank you all so much, really appreciate it. I yield back. I thank the gentlelady for yielding, and I now recognize the gentleman from North Dakota, Mr. Armstrong, for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I think it's important to recognize when we talk about this that we're not starting at zero. And so since we've had a lot of talk about statistics, I'm going to do a couple more. According to the Judicial Conference, there are 42 federal judicial emergencies currently in Article I courts right now. As defined, any vacancy where weighted filings are in excess of 600 people per, or 600 filings per judgeship, or any vacancy in existence more than 18 months where weighted filings are between 430 to 600 per judgeship, or any vacancy where weighted filings exceed 800 per active judge. In 2017, Judi Judicial Conference requested Congress create 57 new Article III judgeships, which included five new appeals court judgeships. Judicial Conference notes that since 1990, when the last omnibus judge, judgeship legislation was enacted, appeal filings have increased 40% and district court filings have increased 38%, with civil case filings up 38% and criminal filings up almost 40%. In 2018, the combined filings in district court for civil cases and criminal defendants rose 7% to 370,085. Civil filings increased 6% to 282,000. Filings for criminal defendants went up 13% to 87,149, and criminal filings rose in 64 of 94 districts. Federal judiciary stats of, as of September 30th, 2019, is that there were 456,827 pending cases in federal district courts. For criminal cases, from filing to disposition is an average of seven months, which is actually a, a 0.5 month decrease since 2014, although I would argue, and hopefully at some point in time we can work on this, there are an unbelievable amount of incentives to get those down because of the incentives for pleading guilty and the disincentives, disincentives for a defendant to go to jury trial in federal court, which I think is something we should maybe look at. Um, and for civil cases, from filing to disposition is 10.8 10, 10, 10 months, which is a two and a half month increase from 2014. Long-standing civil cases, there are 56,356 pending civil cases that are over three years old, which represents a 15.8% of all civil cases. And it's approximately 26,000 case increase since 2014. All of this is to say that with regard, we deal with backlogs in immigration courts, but we have a problem in our Article I courts as it is. And so, as a separate but equal branch of government, they are independent, and Congress has no ability to influence the productivity outside of providing additional resources, which I don't think anybody disagrees. If we would make this move, there would be an, there would be an absolute, absolute need for increased um, resources. So the case metrics and performance goals implemented by the Executive Office for Immigration Review help provide efficient adjudication in immigration courts. And if immigration courts were transferred to Article I courts, there would be minimal ways to influence productivity. And I, so I'd say all that with the recognition that I agree, I don't like a backlog in any court. I spend a lot of time with in-custody clients in federal court. It is an incredibly <laughs> frustrating situation for them, their families, all of those things. Now, the benefit is, is they were earning good time, provided what they were going to get their sentence on the back end. But, Mr. Arthur, there's a backlog, there's a case backlog currently exceeding a million cases, right? And, That's correct. And about half of those cases are asylum cases? Just about. Can you explain why an asylum application, dis an individual would have an incentive to claim fear or to ultimately file an asylum case in the United States? If an individual arrives at the border, uh, they're subject to expedited removal, which means that a DHS officer can simply remove them from the United States. If they claim credible fear, on the other hand, uh, they are eligible to be interviewed by an asylum officer, who, by the way, is also not an Article I judge, 
Uh, and they, uh, if the asylum officer finds they have a credible fear, which they do in about 70, I think 5% of the uh, cases, those individuals are then allowed into the United States to apply for asylum before an immigration judge. Most of those individuals are released into the interior of the United States and can stay here per, uh, until their case is resolved, and ICE doesn't have the resources to find them. And then with my last, just 27 seconds, I think it's important to recognize that when we're dealing this and moving them into Article I creates. So Judicial Conference has restated and talking to federal judges, their longstanding opposition to federalized or specialized courts in the federal judiciary. And regarding a legislative proposal to put immigration courts in there, that's exactly what we'd be doing. So can you imagine the resources, just real quick, Mr. Arthur, we'd have to give to Article I if we were going to create a specialized court in the federal judiciary? It would be as large as we would need to actually create an effective court within EOR right now. And the other thing is there would be no congressional accountability. Right now you can call in the director of EOR if you have problems about the uh, issues that have been discussed. You don't have that ability when you have an Article I court. Who are you going to call in the Chief Justice of the United States? That's a problem. Gentleman yields back. I now recognize the gentlelady from Florida, Ms. McCarcel Powell, for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for coming this morning. I think we all agree that the current state of our immigration court system is not only completely inefficient, it is truly appalling. Backlogs, overworked judges, lack of access to counsel, all of these things are harming immigrants. We get so many calls on a daily basis in my district, in Florida's 26th district, asking for help because of these backlogs. And to add to this problem, the administration seems to have designed a process where individuals appearing in immigration court face a staggering lack of access to counsel. Only 37 immigrants appearing before an immigration judge are represented by an attorney. Matters are even worse for immigrants caught in the Remain Mexico program or those who are transferred hundreds of miles away by ICE, far from their attorneys. Lawyers are simply unavailable. They can't travel to these remote locations to represent their clients, uh, undocumented immigrants. This lack of counsel is not only limited to adults. A majority of children in removal proceedings are also not represented by counsel. Unaccompanied children, regardless of their age, are simply not entitled to an attorney. The system is vast and complex, but it is completely absurd and incomprehensible that a child is expected to appear in court without the representation of a lawyer and plead his or her case. I don't understand what is happening in this country. It's truly appalling. What we're talking here is having immigrants have their day in court, they are trying to follow our rules. They're following the law. They're working through the process. Most are doing everything possible that, that with, with the tools that they have available to follow the laws. And um, what we're seeing is that the system is built to work against them. They're stuck in limbo. They don't have the opportunity for basic due process or even to present their case because of this administration's anti-immigrant policies and the failure to effectively govern our immigration court system. So I want to start with um, Mr. McKinney. Um, almost one in 10 immigration court cases, one in 10 involves an un unaccompanied child. Despite this, a majority of unaccompanied children in removal proceedings simply don't have representation. They don't have a lawyer. Mr. McKinney, in your view, how difficult would it be for any individual, an adult or a child to work and navigate this process without an attorney? Thank you for your question. Almost impossible. And let me describe to you the current system uh, when a child is involved. Uh, a couple of years ago, I received a phone call from an immigration judge. Now, he had uh, cleared this with the trial counsel for Homeland Security before calling. Uh, there was a five-year-old uh, in the back seat of a car, uh, and there was an accident, and the mother died leaving this child uh, an orphan and in the custody of North Carolina Department of Social Services. Uh, and he didn't have an attorney. And so the only system we have in place right now is a phone call from an immigration judge asking if I would agree to do it pro bono or could find someone that could help. 
that's unacceptable. That it should that should be offensive to every American uh, that we have a system like that. And I think that we're starting to see strides in the area of respondents with mental health problems, but youth. Juvenile status is another form of incapacity, and I think that's a great place to start in making sure. Council, access to counsel is a win for everyone. Uh, in absentia rates drop to about 3% when a person is represented by an attorney. Cases are presented properly. When someone doesn't have a case, they have an attorney to tell them that. Uh, it's, it's a win for everyone. Thank you, and can you explain a little bit how the systems that have been implement, implemented by this administration for immigration courts make it more difficult for children to find legal representation? Uh, absolutely. Uh, well, first of all, the, this Department of Justice attempted to end the legal orientation program, uh, but fortunately was halted by Congress. Um, too oftentimes we see these courts located in areas where there just simply aren't enough attorneys available. Uh, and at the end of the day, it is not uh, free. Private attorneys have to charge. There's no system of legal aid or uh, legal defense uh, for respondents, and children, of course, aren't wage earners. Uh, so it's an area de in desperate need of reform. Thank you, Mr. McKinney. One last question uh, for you, Ms. Martins. The gentlelady's time is expired. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, I now recognize the gentlewoman from Texas, Ms. Jackson Lee, for five minutes. Let me thank uh, the witnesses and, and thank you, Madam Chair, for uh, the opportunity. Let me, let me first of all um, pose a question to um, Judge uh, Tabador on possible solutions to what I've been hearing and what, I've, what I'm reading and what I'm experiencing. I noted that the thousands of cases uh, are mostly in jurisdictions, San Francisco, I think, San Francisco, New York, but it includes Houston, five top areas where asylum cases are. Uh, and we know that there's a question of overload. I also know that there's a question to my uh, immigration friend, lawyer there, uh, that uh, we're questioning the kind of experience uh, that uh, immigration judges are now being uh, appointed with, meaning individuals are being appointed with no experience in immigration law at all. But my, my interest is your thoughts about creating an independent executive branch agency or Article I court. I know you've discussed it, but I'd like to ask that to Judge uh, Tabador and uh, Mr. McKinney. Judge? Thank you, Representative. Um, as we've stated, there are a number of components that are important in considering why an Article I court would be a, a solution for the issues we're facing. You've highlighted the issue of the immigration judge selection. Uh, while we have amazing judges on the bench, if you look at it, the diversity of professional background and personal background is lacking. So one of the issues has been the integrity and the respect that the, the bench would, uh, the, the bar would have for the bench, because when they look at the bench, they only see a very sliver of the larger pie on the bench, and that compromises the respect and the integrity of the court. Uh, and then we've seen, as you've mentioned, um, um, a, a lot of uh, questionable hiring, particularly in the in the area of management positions for immigration for the immigration court, the assistant chief immigration judges. Um, we, we're seeing people who are being chosen to supervise immigration judges who've never been on the bench, uh, much less been immigration judges, or they've been immigration judges for a second. You know, you, let's let's say just a few months before they're they're elevated. You you would prefer the Article One courts. Absolutely, because it would allow for a, a degree of accountability to, on both merit and as well as the diversity of personal professional background. Um, hopefully with a change of administration that might be accurate. Mr. McKinney. Uh, Representative uh, uh, Jackson Lee, we, I would uh, argue that we need a change uh, to the statute. Uh, because the problems with uh, politicized hirings and uh, uh, judges having very similar government backgrounds uh, was a problem in past administrations as well. I remember conversations uh, with uh, the late Director Asuna about this problem. Uh, and his response was, well, government attorneys tend to go through security checks quicker. Government attorneys tend to want to stay in government. And so those are two drivers 
uh, for why so many of the judges have this uh, ICE attorney uh, background. Uh, so my time is going. You want to just say what you would prefer? What we need is a is a independent court where uh, you have experience requirements for the judges. Uh, and you have an advisory panel that's providing some guidance, and that panel is made up of a mix of different backgrounds. Thank you. Let me focus on the asylum, which is now, um, I believe, in shambles, not because of the excellent persons that are working, including judges, committed judges, committed immigration lawyers. But let me wrap this question in, and I'm going back to the two of you for the answers. I met with immigration judges uh, this past uh, week, and this does tie to, to administration. Uh, they were disturbed because they were not able to meet with immigration services like they used to locally to get a notice about things, changes and all. Everybody was shut down. They weren't able to meet with ICE. This is not on a particular case. I'd just be interested, Mr. Kinney, if you find that to be the case. But the real question I'm asking is the shambles of asylum and the process of remaining in Mexico program, how that has impacted uh, uh, the, the uh, hearing process, the denial process, 60% denial in asylums or more. Uh, if you would, in a short time, I'm 33 seconds. So if you would take just a moment, Judge, and just a moment, Mr. McKinney. Just a quick point on that. I can tell you that my colleagues at the border are absolutely overwhelmed by the sheer number of cases that they are being told they have to process on a daily basis, up to 100, 120 cases a day, without support staff, without filings, without an ability to be able to directly reach out to the individuals. Thank you, Ms. McKinney. And there's no reason for uh, people not to be able to sit in the court when there's an asylum hearing, but go right ahead. Uh, with the permission of the asylum seeker, there should be no problem with that. Uh, just imagine you're in a situation with a small tent looking at a TV camera, it's almost, uh, or a TV, it's almost Orwellian in an approach to a person seeking protection from persecution or torture. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, I yield back. Thank you, the gentlelady yields back. I now recognize the gentleman from North Dakota for a unanimous consent request. Thank you, Madam Chair. I ask unanimous consent to enter the following into the record. Report of Proceedings of the Judicial Conference of the United States dated September 13, 2016, reaffirming its position that the immigration courts not be placed in the judiciary branch. Chart from the Executive Office for Immigration Review showing the skyrocketing number of cases and the uptick in completions under the Trump administration. Chart from the Executive Office of Immigration Review showing skyrocketing number of asylum applications in immigration courts since 2016, and the chart from EOIR showing 80% of cases over the course of a year are represented by counsel. So ordered. Thank you, ma'am. I now recognize the gentlelady from Arizona, Ms. Lesko, for five minutes. Thank you. I apologize. I couldn't be here to hear all of you. I was in another committee hearing where they, we had votes on bills, um, so I'm a little disappointed in that. But I do have a, a couple questions uh, for our, our witness, uh, Mr. Arthur, I believe. Where is it? Mr. Arthur, thank you. Uh, Mr. Arthur. Are you aware of any effort uh, by the EOIR under the Trump administration to tell immigration judges how they should rule in a particular case? Uh, no, I'm not. And in fact, if you look at the asylum grant rates uh, for 2019, for FY 2019 versus FY 2018, they're almost identical. I think it's 20.25 versus 20.51. And the grant rates for asylum are actually higher in FY 2019 than they were in FY 2017, I think FY, 2000, uh, FY 2016 as well. And Mr. Arthur, would you uh, uh, agree that it is really the underlying problems of all of the uh, rush of people coming, especially from Central America, the families that are causing this backlog, not necessarily procedural uh, type things within the courts? I, actually, uh, I would, uh, Ms. Lesko, and let me just make uh, a very important point. Asylum is probably the closest thing that we have in federal law to an almost sacred trust. It is uh, the United States government putting the cloak of protection over a person. It's absolutely crucial that good cases get heard, and what we need to do is diminish the number of bad cases. Eeyore issued some statistics on family units for selected courts. 
uh, 10 selected courts. I don't know how represented they are. Family unit cases showed a 69% in absentia removal rate with respect to initial case completions. Now that suggests to me that those individuals never actually had good asylum claims to begin with or any asylum claims to begin with at the time that they entered the United States. Absolutely crucial that we protect people who need protection, protect their loved ones abroad. So we got to get to those uh, good cases and eliminate the bad. And um, I've got a couple more minutes. So, um, Mr. Arthur, are you aware of the ABA report on the state of immigration courts? Uh, I am aware of it, yes. Do you believe that the report accurately reflects the state of immigration courts as inherently lacking in the ability to provide due process to litigants? I would not, and actually the word due process was used previously. I would note that due process is not a fixed term. It's the process that is due. Uh, so it varies from tribunal to tribunal and to the degree in which, uh, to, to the application that someone's making. So with respect to uh, asylum, I commend Judge Tabador, who I've known for, I think, two decades, uh, and my former colleagues on the bench for their ability to provide due process to the individuals that appear before them. Again, Ms. Lesko, keep in mind, Congress has set a 180-day time frame for the adjudication of asylum applications. This is nothing that this administration, nothing that EOR has done. So the department finds itself between the sill and the charybdis, between complying with Congress and actually getting the cases done. If we cut down the backlog, or if we cut down the number of people who enter the United States illegally and make fraudulent claims or make non-meritorious claims, the quicker we're going to be able to get to those good claims. We heard from Mr. Nagus earlier. I mean, that was a touching story about how his family came here as refugees. That's what we need to do. That's what we should be doing as a country. But what we have to do is we have to cut down the number of people who are going to come here and make fraudulent claims. And thank you for that. I have introduced six bills myself to try to get at the root of uh, the increase in the immigration crisis. Um, unfortunately, none of them have been heard. One of them would increase the number of immigration judges, and I was hoping that my Democratic colleagues would join me on that, because I also serve on the Rules Committee, where uh, at least two of the members have said that that was a good idea, including, uh, I believe, the chairman, if my memory uh, is correct, and would that help the problem, increasing the number of immigration judges? Absolutely. We probably need about 700 immigration judges to take care of the issue. We're at 465 right now, so we have about 235 to go, and even then there's going to be a lag time in hiring. Thank you, and I yield back. General Lady yields back. I now recognize the gentlewoman from Pennsylvania, Ms. Scanlon, for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, We've heard some assertions today that the high backlog of immigration cases is due to some extraordinary number of undocumented immigrants either crossing our border now or um, it being in the U.S. entirely, although both those numbers have dropped in recent years. We've also heard a suggestion that the failure of immigrants to appear for hearings is causing this backlog, and that's just flat out wrong. I mean, the statistics show that actually the data shows that um, appearances have in, the percentage of appearances have increased over time, and um, to the extent that the administration argues otherwise, that's because data has been manipulated to produce what one of my colleagues referred to earlier as lies, damn lies, or statistics. So I'd like to ask unanimous consent to introduce this Human Rights First report on immigration court appearance rates. Without objection. Okay. Now, that report talks about a couple factors that I'd like to dig into a little more. One is the impact of lack of notice on people appearing for their hearings, and the other is the impact of access to counsel. So, Judge Tabador, I know um, you're aware of a case that uh, was infamous in Philadelphia a few years back where we had an immigration court judge who used a procedural um, tactic to delay an immigration case because the 
um, person in that case had not received notice of the hearing. So rather than deport the person for not showing up for a hearing that they had no notice of, the judge delayed the case. And it's my understanding that the case was then taken away from that judge and given to someone else who did deport that person. Can you comment on that case and how it relates to this issue of your um, taking away judges' discretion and pressuring them to deport people? Yes, thank you. We've talked about the, the use of certification process in a politicized manner, and one of that has been taking away the judge's authority to administratively close a case, which is to put it aside until the issue that needs to be resolved is resolved. And uh, my colleague was concerned about the issue of notice of an unaccompanied child. I can tell you that we started the Van Nuys Immigration Court just less than a month and a half ago, and for the entire month of January, we have cases that have been put on our calendar where I come to courtrooms that are half em empty and realize that actually the notices were not sent out, even though we were told that notices have been sent. I also see regularly now, because they want to move up the cases, cases that have been scheduled for future dates are being moved up, and, and people don't, it's, it creates confusion as to the issue of notice. So we have absolutely seen uh, the problematic nature of dealing with the court as sort of a factory model of constantly moving the pieces and, and then expecting the court to function normally. And expecting um, people who are subject to hearings to be able to show up if they don't know a hearing is coming. Absolutely. Okay. I mean, this is a little bit personal. I had, I've had a couple immigration cases and there was one that for six years the court couldn't, or ICE or, or whomever couldn't seem to give me notice of when my client's next action was due, despite filing multiple notices of appearance. So it's kind of a systemic issue. Um, the other um, factor that plays heavily into whether people show up for their hearings is whether they have counsel. Um, so Mr. McKinney, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about that. Um, I have some familiarity with the um, facility in Lumpkin, Georgia, um, the fact that it has the highest, or it did at one point have the highest deportation rate in the country, about 98% of the people um, going to Lumpkin would get deported in large part because they didn't have counsel. Are you familiar with the reports that at least one American citizen was deported from Lumpkin? Uh, yes, uh, that was a, uh, a North Carolina uh, U.S. citizen, uh, and I was a uh, local counsel in the civil suit that followed uh, once that person was finally uh, returned home okay. uh, by a uh, sympathetic consular officer overseas. And similarly, there are people there who have had what have been termed good asylum claims, credible um, asylum claims that they would be subject to death if they were returned home to their countries. And without counsel, they were in fact deported and were in fact uh, killed when they were returned to their home countries. Is that correct? Absolutely. There, there have been a few studies on this. One shows that there's at least a, uh, a respondent is 14 times more likely to gain relief if that person has counsel. And it makes sense uh, because a knowledgeable and effective attorney uh, will know how to present a case and know when a case is bad also with uh, uh, representative so uh, it's really the key ingredient, but I can't even, I mean, when I have a case in Lumpkin, I have to go from North Carolina, fly to Atlanta, rent a car, stay in Columbus, drive another 45 minutes south, and pray that I will get a waiting room and the, with the limited resources they have to meet with my client. It's, it's really a mess. Um, Judge Gentilady's time has okay. expired. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I, without objection, I request that the statements from the following organizations be included in the record. American Immigration Council, Center for Gender and Refugee Studies, Coalition for Humane Immigrant Rights, the Constitution Project at the Project on Government Oversight, Florence Immigrant and Refugee Rights Project, Human Rights First, Human Rights Initiative of North Texas, Kids in Need of Defense, Law Firm of Hassan M. Ahmad, National Immigrant Justice Center, National Immigration Forum, New York City Bar Association, New York Legal Assistance Group, Refugees International, Roundtable of Former Immigration Judges, Young Center for Immigrant Children's Rights, Joint Letter from Innovation Law Lab, Southern Poverty Law Center, Las Americas Immigrant Advocacy Center, Santa Fe Dreamers Project, and Catholic Legal Immigration Network. 
This concludes today's hearing. I would like to once again thank all of the witnesses for your compelling testimony and for participating in this hearing. Without objection, all members will have five legislative days to submit additional written questions for the witness or additional materials for the record. Without objection, the hearing is adjourned. Thank you.